that number before? I hope I did. All right, let's stand together and sing it. Bringing in the sheets. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontime and the dewy eve, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing. Bringing in the sheaves, sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. Shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, going forth and weeping, sowing for the master. Though the loss sustained, our spirit often grieves. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We will come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. In the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Thanks, you can have a seat. Uh, tonight's missions minute is uh, an update from the Walkers, our neighbors to the south. Uh, they're adding on to their facilities. In the video, I believe, if you look off to the right, you can see their uh, existing facilities and uh, it shows the addition is um, cinder blocks and the roof, and then toward the end is an, uh, an animation of what is still yet to come with it being uh, completed. I think it's something that Tricia has stitched together for us, so uh, we'll have a look at that. Ms. Tricia.
can. So I believe early on in the construction video, they, when they were taking the pictures with the drone, I think they're going to use that to drop gospel bombs in places <laughs> they can't quite reach yet. Absolutely. William's going to apply for that job, dropping gospel bombs. Yeah. Let's pray for the offering. Dear Lord, we do thank you for this time we can share together tonight. Lord, we thank you for the preaching of your word, for the opportunity to give. Lord, we thank you for uh, the walkers, Lord, and their service in Mexico. Lord, we thank you that uh, your gospel is a lot better deal than NAFTA. It's a lot better deal than walls. It's a lot better way to spend our money. Lord, we pray that as we reach our neighbors to the south and our neighbors to the north, that all over North America, the gospel would be prolific. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to participate in that, both by praying and financially. Lord, we thank you again for this opportunity to give. I pray that you would uh, bless uh, each giver. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. I sense a different touch on the keyboard. That's why I kind of did a, a little lean back and double take. And uh, but I'm telling you, Lauren, you're developing expression. I know I'm not a musical expert, but but you're you're developing some, putting some sweet touches on that. And uh, man, that is great. We we appreciate your enthusiastic playing, but that was just a sweet touch and very very nice. All right, let's get down to beeswax for some of our folks here. For example. If you are a Joy Bell, ages four through nine, follow Mrs. Miracle and Miss Darlene. Mrs. Ms. Benninger, thank you so much for helping us with these boys and girls. <laughs> it must be a great program you do a victory dance, or is it just escaping the preaching? I'm not sure which. Also, if you speak Spanish and like a sermon in Spanish, or if you're learning Spanish, follow Brother Aguilar to the... Oh, uh, uh, Yvette, God bless you to see you, sister. Praise the Lord, didn't see you there. And another fine new addition to our church recently. Praise the Lord, been coming faithfully. What? What are you a herder now? Her no, they were laughing about getting in line with Mrs. Miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Look, they're going upstairs to become joy bells. That's amazing. Wow. All right. <laughs> a lot, yeah, what, what, what are we calling him now? Oh, uh, righteous ding dong. Something like that. Yes, yes, the Lord's dinglings, indeed. And then what's the name for the joy bells? <laughs> Never mind. All right, so if you'll please uh, take your Bibles and have them ready. I'll give you a scripture in just a few moments. All right. President Calvin Coolidge was a fine Christian man. Considering the matter of attaining success in life, of which he did know something, having uh, attained success in several areas, including the presidency, Coolidge said, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. 
Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Raising a family, getting education, building a business, advancing in a career, expanding your walk with God and developing a ministry all require determination, steadfastness, and longevity. In short, perseverance is the key to success. Benjamin Franklin was an entrepreneur, scientist, inventor, politician, and statesman. And, I, and from the looks of it, what we just you learn things at church, looks like he invented both the sunglasses and the straps that hold them around your neck. From what we just saw a few moments on the time change, the time change video. And so this man wrote, do not fear mistakes. You will know failure. Continue to reach out. Nothing meaningful and lasting can be accomplished if you're not willing to stick to the task through thick and thin. Winston Churchill was Britain's great prime minister during the long and dark national ordeal that was World War II. Churchill led his people to victory against overwhelming odds. He wrote, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll help us tonight to see how vital it is for our church that we be, that we be a people who will continue, that will be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I pray that we'll grasp the notion that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that'll motivate us to keep going and keep reaching out to others and not resting upon the successes of the past or being hindered by our failures, but just keep pressing on. I pray God you'll please help us tonight to accept this individually, but also, Lord, corporately as a church, may this be the attitude we have. We just cannot be stopped. We thank you, Lord. Please bless the service I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you now please turn to Acts chapter 8, the book of Acts chapter 8. When we think about the original Baptist Church of Jerusalem and the daughter churches all over the world that sprung up from her, we tend to think of a miraculous explosion of growth that required almost no human effort at all. The reality is that the early church planters faced all the challenges that we do and the same inhib in human inhibitions that you and I have, and probably more intense opposition, but without any of the technological advantages that we enjoy today. They had to work just as hard, if not harder, to win souls, disciple converts, and establish strong churches. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and what did Philip do? He preached what? Christ to where? Unto them. He preached Christ unto them. There in Samaria. Now, just, just to back up a little bit, Samaria was the former capital city of Israel. When Israel and Judah split, Samaria became the capital under King Ahab. And then that region became known as Samaria. And the Samaritans were a marked people in Jewish minds because they mixed with the local inhabitants, you know, the, the, the people there in Canaan, and, and became what we might consider to be both racially and spiritually a half-breed people. And so they were despised by the, the, the Jews of a more pure blood. And in verse number six, so nonetheless, Philip, he was a Jew, but he had a heart. God had changed him from a hardened Hebrew who hated Samaritans into a Christian who loved their souls. And he preached Christ unto them. Verse number six, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was what in that city? Great joy. Things change for the better in every society in which the gospel is introduced and then embraced by a significant number of people in that place. Verse number nine. But there was a certain man called Simon, 
which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. And so this, this man, Simon, he, uh, uh, he, he, went, he, he was one who was used to getting a lot of attention. And, uh, but uh, in verse number 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Because the gospel is not meant to be hoarded by the individual. I'm just glad I'm saved going to heaven, but I don't care about anybody else. It's meant to be preached to others. Where Christ is preached, people can believe upon him. Believing in Jesus, trusting him, and receiving his free gift of eternal life transforms the person in a radical operation of the Holy Spirit called the new birth. Now this man Simon, however, he still had a lot of the old nature in him. He still had a lot of the flesh controlling him. Uh, the, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life were very much a part of him. And so he took a little extra work. But Philip spent special time with this man Simon and invested in him. So that later, when uh, he tried to purchase the power to confer upon people the Holy Ghost, you know, and he was rebuked by Peter... He received that rebuke, changed his way. He had a change of heart. He repented on the spot, and it, was, you know, and it just showed how he had truly been saved. Now look at verse number 14. Verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So these people have been saved and baptized, but they've not yet received the Holy Ghost. Now, let me just clarify for a moment that we are dealing in the book of Acts in a time of transition. Spiritually speaking, it's a time of transition. What we are used to today is you get saved, and the Holy Spirit comes to live within you at that moment. And he's sealed within you. But for these people... You know, there's, this is still a time, there's still a lot of confusion. The New Testament's not yet completed. There's, there's still uh, you know, some contrary ways of looking at things. And the, it, it, for this time period, the Holy Ghost was conferred upon people uh, through the apostles. And they would receive the Holy Ghost. And verse number 25, and when they had heard, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, uh, verse 25 again, when they, when, and they... When they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem. So remember, Peter and John were sent down to help the Samaritans. They, they went back up to Jerusalem. It says, along the way, they preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So what you see here is a consistent effort on behalf of Philip, the evangelist, and James, and I'm, I'm sorry, and Peter and John to preach the gospel in the city of Samaria and the region of Samaria, and it resulted in souls getting saved. And all the more remarkable because of the natural animosity between Jews and Samaritans, but that's what the gospel does to us. We look at people that formerly we would have had nothing to do with, perhaps even felt ourselves superior to, or just, just don't like, and we find ourselves, our hearts softening toward them. We want to see that race. We want to see that class of people. We want to see the people from that place. We want to see the people from that religion getting saved. Now, turn please to Acts chapter 15, verse 22. But none of this happens without somebody making the effort to reach out and just not giving up. Someone's got to, someone's got to do it. Success is the child of persistence okay as as we as we press ahead and we just refuse to give up at some point we're often going to see things happen that of course could not happen would never happen had we at the moment of opposition just decided well then fine it's not working i quit i want to i just want to do something else for a change let someone else do it and everything would have, you know, nothing would have proceeded beyond that point. But for the person who just refuses to throw in the towel, so what does that mean? That's an old boxing term, you know, when, when the, the manager in the corner of a boxer, when he's seeing his, his fighter getting beat to a pulp, but the guy's just too stubborn <laughs> to, to, to quit, and he's about to get himself killed, 
The manager can take the towel and throw it in the ring, and that stops the fight right there. Throw in the towel, you know, or raise the white flag, or show the white feather, or, or however you want to express it. But, you know, for the person who just refuses to give up and just keeps pressing on, and that person will see far more happen in life than the person who easily rolls over and plays dead, surrenders, caves in. Vince Lombardi was one of the most successful pro professional football coaches of all time. Lombardi stated, the difference between a successful person and others is not a lack of strength, but rather a lack of will. Those others, he's referring to very kindly, he could have easily said the failures. The difference between the successful people and the failures, or as he put it, the others, is that the others, not that they, they, they don't have less strength than the ones that went on to succeed. They just didn't have the will. They had a lack of will. They just gave up easier. The apostles and their heirs saw great things happen because they continuously appealed to a great savior for the souls of men and appealed to, appealed to the souls of men for a great savior. Now, Acts 15, verse 22. Acts 15, 22. Then pleased that the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to what place? Antioch, with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, named Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So the church in Jerusalem sent of their cream of the crop, they sent some of their best up-and-coming young preachers to this far-off place, uh, much further to the north along the rim of the, 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 the Mediterranean, the northeast Mediterranean, but an influential city called Antioch. These men were sent to the Gentile believers in Antioch with a message from the apostles in Jerusalem that they need not become Jews in order to become Christians. And that was good news to them. All these heavy demands of the law would not be placed upon them. Verse number 30. Verse 30, so when they were dismissed, in other words, dismissed from the church of Jerusalem and allowed to proceed on, and, and, and you know, I just thought about this just now. That is, that phrase, so when they were dismissed, it's amazing how the little things in the Bible just, just come, when you give it some meditation, they come to life. That says a lot for pastoral authority in the church. These guys just didn't take it in their head to run off and do this and do that. You know, they were, they were committed to, no doubt, their, their function, their ministries within the church, and they got permission to go. And when the time was right, they were, they were, okay, now we can let you go. We got you covered. Everything, you know, we, we, can, we can sustain the loss of you, of you being here with us. It's time for you to go. Go, go fulfill this ministry God's given, given you and we have, we have commissioned you to do. So verse 30, so when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. In other words, that, that message from the apostles in Jerusalem. They need not become Hebrews in order to become Christians. Verse 31. Which when they had read, they, were, they rejoiced for the consolation. That was like, whew, glory. Don't have to do all that stuff required of a Jew. Verse 32. And, Ju and Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Now, when it says being prophets also themselves, realize again, the New Testament wasn't yet completed. So in the first century churches, God was still using prophets who could speak the word of God directly as it was given to them from heaven through the Holy Spirit to the people. But as the Bible was completed, that office, that function ceased to, to, to exist because now we have God's word. We don't have to trust to what some man says is God's word. We have it right here, secure in written form. So, uh, but in this time, they were prophets and they exhorted the brethren. They taught them, they encouraged them with many words. And I'm afraid we just can't get around that, beloved. Can't get around that. My goodness, I, I, I almost felt like building a whole, you know, we're under the, the theme continue right now this year in our church. I, I, I was toying with the idea of building a whole sermon around how uh, one, day, one night when uh, Paul was in a place preaching, he continued till midnight. And just wanted to challenge you with the fact that, beloved, we're, our services are way too short. 
and the preaching is just not nearly enough. We need to press on. We ought to have some service. We just press on until midnight. I'm not hearing any amens here tonight, so maybe. <laughs> but I, I, on the other hand, I was going to tell you how good we got it. Man, now we haven't had any, any six-hour services yet, five-hour. Not to say we shouldn't have someday. I mean, if the Holy Spirit just, just came down and just things just took off and got exciting, I, I, I could see it, it happening, especially in a time of great distress. In other words, if persecution begins and so, and so forth, I could see where we would just be soaking up the Word of God and could, just couldn't get enough of it. And just like, help us, preacher, and encourage us, and, and, and man, get, get us excited again about our faith. But anyway, he exhorted the brother with many words. Can't get around that. It just, it, it, there's a lot to be taught. A lot needs to be said. But also in verse 32, he did what at the end of that verse? He confirmed them. These preachers confirmed them. Now that's in the same sense as when the Arianos family, it was before you tonight, when they jo before they joined the church, uh, they got a copy of our Constitution, and I realize that's all in English, and they speak Spanish, but we do the best we can to, you know, through Brother Aguilar to provide explanation. And, uh, but, but we give, as, as most of you understand that have been here uh, and joined our church in these last 13 years, we have, a little, we have a simple process. We give you the Constitution. We let you read through it. Uh, make sure you have, answer, we answer any questions. We, we arrange a meeting with me, so if you answer and ask any questions you might have and, and try to help get clarification. And so, uh, and I want to make sure you, as far as your testimony is concerned, what you claim, because I don't know your heart, but you claim to have, at some point in your life, you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, and after you were saved, you were baptized, and you're willing to acknowledge these, this is the church covenant, this is what we believe, and I understand we don't all, you know, stand for every particular in the, in the church constitution in the sense of there's some things in certain families we do a little different than, than that ideal, but at least you're not going to come in here and try to change us. You understand that when it comes to preaching and teaching, that's where we stand. You're not going to come in and try to undermine that and try to change it from within, you know, but you're going to acknowledge and respect that that is our official position on these various issues. So we want to confirm that they are truly saved and they've been baptized. So this is not to be confused with the... The, the Catholic construct of confirmation, or the which, which then was passed on to many of the Protestant denominations, you know that that is that's a totally false, heretical position where the idea is uh, the baby's born at the age of eight days or so is is baptized or what they call baptism, which is not baptism at all. Baptism by its very nature is an immersion, not a sprinkling or a pouring. And so, uh, but, but nonetheless, they call that baptism, and through that method, that baby is put into the body of Christ and becomes part of the church. But then in an acknowledgement that a person needs to, you know, have their own faith type thing, uh, they go through a time of training called catechism, which basically is a, uh, you memorize these answers to these questions. And when you can spout them off more or less correctly, then we'll take you in before uh, the, the, the parish or the church, and we will con you'll have a confirmation where we confirm that, that uh, you are a true Christian. You know, whether or not you've ever believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether or not you've ever acknowledged you're a sinner on your way to hell, and that you're, Christ is the only way of salvation, and that that very church cannot save you. Nor could the infant baptism, nor can the confirmation, nor can taking First Communion, which is becoming now, coming up on Easter, is going to be a big deal. We're feeling the impact of it, as we always do this time of year in our bus ministry. You know, Catholic families pulling their kids off the bus to go to catechism, to go to First Communion, and all of a sudden there's this rush of kind of religious patriotism. You know, we are a Catholic home, and we're not going to send our kids anymore to the Baptist church. Uh, and then hopefully over time they get over that and start letting the kids come again, you know, especially for the free babysitting. And uh, so, but which, we're, which we're glad with, whatever pretext to get them here to teach them the truth. So when it says confirm them, we're not talking, you know, you got to erase from your mind the, the, the Catholic definition of that. And it's simply a matter of we want to make sure you're, you really are saved and you understand what your faith means. And, and verse number 33 and after that they had, next two words, tarried there a space. They were not in a hurry. That's probably my greatest downfall. 
hurry, hurry, hurry. There's much to be done. Uh, but, but they tarried. And when they had done that, they tarried there a space. They were, let, in verse 33, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. So it's like, okay, thanks for your help. We, we think we understand it now. We're ready to let you go back to Jerusalem. In verse 34, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still. So these two men, uh, two of these, these two men, they were sent from Jerusalem down to help, to, to Antioch to help them. And uh, when they were released, so okay, we thanks so much for all your help. One returned to Jerusalem, the other one said, you know, I just feel like there's more that can be done here. And stuck it out. Verse 35, Paul also, Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of God with many others also. So apparently, for some reason, a flock of believers gathered around Antioch. Now, the result of this investment of time and attention was the development of the great church in Antioch. And beloved, all those men who poured themselves into that place and those people are, even to this day, reap, they're reaping a rich harvest. Because so much of who we are and what we are traces back to the church at Antioch. You know, it was in Antioch where the believers were first called what? Christians. That was how strongly they were identified with Christ. And more than that, what's interesting is uh, across the Mediterranean from them, due south in Alexandria, Egypt, a man rose up, a very influential man, a, a, a scholar, and there were some things about the Bible that offended him, very similar to Charles Taze Russell, who founded the, what became eventually known as the Watchtower or the Jehovah's Witnesses. And he just you know, began to change things wantonly to match his own peculiar beliefs. Well, so did this man, Origen, in, in Alexandria, Egypt. He, uh, there were certain things in the Bible he didn't like, so he began to change things. And when the emperor of Rome, and, a, and this is a, a couple of centuries down the road, when the emperor of Rome wanted 50 copies of Scripture, he had his team of scholars write out his version of the Bible. That went to Rome, and that right there became the basis of all the modern versions we have today. All of them are messed up. But you know where the Word of God was preserved and, and was, was then replicated and passed around? Antioch. Our King James Bible is the fruit of the church in Antioch, which was the fruit of these men who poured themselves into that, that people of that place. Just turn please to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. There is no magic wand of ministry. There wasn't in the first century, and there isn't today. You cannot simply send a preacher uh, to a group of people, and poof, a strong church springs up. This was, this was highlighted for me the last couple of years when I, I heard that uh, a couple from one of our California Bible colleges had gone to Dixon to start a church, but halfway between here and Sacramento, Dixon. Dixon has a university campus there. It's like the biggest thing in town, University of California, Dixon. Dixon. And uh, uh, is, is this California State or UC? Anybody know? Well, whatever it is. I said Dixie, down in the land of Dixie. No, I meant not Dixon, Davis. UC Davis. Indeed, yes, that one. Yes, got my back. That's good. I need to scratch right there. Okay, so uh, they, uh, they went to start a church there. Nobody would doubt the need. And after laboring for a period of time, you know, it, it just, uh, they, they, they finally uh, decided it, it, they would not be able to continue. And I'm not here to judge them on that. I, I, I realize the struggle. Our founding pastor, you know, I, I, I don't fault him for giving up the church. The hardest thing perhaps a man could do with his life is try to birth a church. It, it, it sucks everything you have in you. And, and the ones that, that go on and, and make it, praise God for them. But, uh, uh, but I, I don't fault those who at least make the effort. And, and even if it doesn't quite work out. Well, anyway, these, it didn't work out for this young couple. And they wound up going to another church. And, and praise God, they stayed in church and they got involved in another church and, are, and have been a key uh, addition to that church, a big help to that pastor. But my point is it just shows that this thing is not 
instantaneous and it is not easy. Some churches grow much faster than others and a few grow much larger than the norm. But every church, small or great, must have within it at least one person, hopefully the pastor, who is dedicating his life to that body of believers and continues serving despite all opposition and obstacles. Growth happens when the passion of that person spreads through the congregation so that more and more people share his dedication and determination and refuse to be stopped. You know, we got some challenges ahead of us. We got a, a humongous amount of rent that we owe. And we, uh, you know, th there comes a point at which the lease expires and it's like, where do we go from here? Or, or you know, will the landlord, will... and then if we stay, we gotta deal with the parking issue and, and this odd thing of being in the middle of these wineries and a brewery and, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> it, 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 we are such, and is the word anachronism, we're, we're such an oddity here, but by the same token, we're a little light in a very dark place. So I can understand why God put us here, but nonetheless, I pray for God to give us parking and, and, and either remove the wineries or put us in a place where we don't have to deal with that influence. Uh, but, you know, God's will be done. But my point is that uh, we got some challenges ahead. And I don't lose a lot of sleep over it. Every once in a while, a little bit. You know, but I'm, I'm human. But for the most part, it's, Lord, this is your church. It's not my church. I'm, I'm bothered when I hear a man who's been in our church for a long time, still refer to it, he talks to me as his pastor and still talks about your church and your people. It's like, wait a minute. Number one, it belongs to Christ. But this is our church. This is our, these are our people. This is our church family. This is us together. This is us corporately. And so, but we, we just got to determine it doesn't matter. Hey, I, I've thought about so like, like what would ha what, you know the great what if? What if we have to go? There's no place to go to. You know, it's like okay, uh, school. Every service we set up and tear down and set up and tear down and set up and tear down and that becomes our life. You know, uh, do we? I've thought of other scenarios too scary to talk about, but just like okay, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to keep this church going in whatever form is pleasing to the Holy Spirit. And maybe some odd arrangement is the wave of the future. I mean, that's just how it'll need to be. Maybe, maybe there will come a day when a, a church doesn't necessarily all gather in one single place at once, you know, together at one time. Uh, maybe, maybe more will get saved. Maybe more of the gospel will get spread out as we have to create satellite situations or you know, I'm not trying to scare you I'm not trying to I'm just trying to say that whatever happens we're going to consider hey if that's God's will we will adjust and we'll make the most of it and maybe better things will happen in the long run than if we could have the cute little church on five acres with the big steeple and lots of parking and ah oh, isn't this wonderful and, and we are just a you know everybody admires us that may not be the way to go for the future would you turn please to Acts chapter 18 while you try to get over the shock of that last statement? Acts chapter 18. After, verse number 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens. Oh, all right, so he spent some time in Athens, but that didn't work well. And he came to another place called what? Ah, that rings a bell, as in the epistles of Paul to, that we know now as 1st and 2nd. Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians. And verse number two. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded that all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, this is Paul, he abode with them and wrought for their occupation, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now, that's interesting. Paul had grown up not just as a scholar, not just as a brain, but he had a practical trade. And it stood him well at this time of his life. There have been some times I have wished I had, I had something other than just the gift of gab. You know, and, uh, and you say, well, like, what, what did you do in those times when you had 
no income. You, you didn't have a full-time position. You didn't have a church paying your salary. What'd you do then? Well, security guard. Oh man, that was that was real fun. Make sure nobody steals this parking lot in the middle of the night, and uh, for hour upon hour upon endless hour, and uh, and then uh, you know, and then sales. Uh, that was, but you know. Everyone assumes a preacher would be a brilliant salesman, but the problem is our heart isn't in it. And we struggle like you do, man. I don't, you know, I'll knock on someone's door for Jesus. <laughs> I don't want to do it for anybody else. I don't want to bother anybody for anything else. And and so, you know, we're we're as, as liable to be a a, a, a big uh, failure in that field as, as anybody else, or perhaps a, a success. I, I realize that I, I know of one preacher, and he made a. That's how Lord Lord took care of him when his church could not pay him, and he made a great income and became you know, as, as a salesman and praise God for it. But I'm, I'm saying it's not necessarily a given. In this case, though, he did have an occupation. He was a tent maker, and these people that he lived with were too. And this was a significant move for Paul, because he had just experienced a very difficult and almost fruitless ministry in Athens, the heart of Greek culture, which is anti-biblical in so many of its aspects. So from Athens, he moved to Corinth. Now, some people would think that's almost like going from, if not the frying pan to the fire, it's like going from the fire into the frying pan. It's just not much of an improvement because Corinth was highly cosmopolitan and intensely heathen. Yet Paul, he, he didn't get discouraged in, in the work of the Lord. He retained his ardor for preaching, discipling, and church planting. He was even willing to provide for his own needs through secular employment in order to reach the city for Christ. Verse number four. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Paul went fishing where the fish were. He targeted the Jews who had a strong basic understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. But he also engaged the Greeks who were thoroughly pagan and had no biblical understanding at all. People from both classes began getting saved. Verse number five. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. A preacher is far more effective when he has the active support of other good, dedicated men. So it's almost like Paul was doing the job by himself, but these other two brethren came and it really got him fired up. You know, I, I'm sorry, but we all perform better when we have an approving audience. You know, uh, I can feel it when my wife's not in the auditorium. If she's serving in ministry somewhere, man, it's just, or she's sick at home. It's like, oh, I, I, I do better when I'm showing off for Laura. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and when you're here, and, and when I get Jacob's amen, and when I, when I, when I hear, you know, I, from time to time, I, you know, Jim's amen, and other guys, man, it, it, it fires you up. And, and just having these guys show up, that was a great encouragement to him. And he did even more for the Lord. And, and so in verse number five, or no, let's drop down to verse number six. And when they opposed themselves, these Jews and Greeks, and blasphemed, oh, that, they went over a line there. He shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. In other words, I gave you a chance. I am clean of your blood. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. I, I, ne I don't necessarily want to go to the highbrow Greeks or these hyper-religious Jews. I'm just going to go to plain, ordinary folk that live all in, this, or in and around this city. Beloved, when one group demonstrates that it's absolutely close to the gospel, we need to seek out another group in the same area. Not necessarily do we have to run away. We just look for somebody else. Verse number 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Isn't that amazing? He got himself a convert. He's there at the synagogue saying, I'm done with you people. And he gets himself a convert right next door. More than that, verse 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. I mean, this is so bizarre. Paul says, I'm done with you Jews. I'm one of the Gentiles. And he gets the guy saved next door. That guy gets saved and the chief ruler of the synagogue, the head honcho Jew himself, he gets saved. And when people heard about that, a whole bunch of people started getting saved. 
man, it's good enough for Christmas, good enough for justice, it's good enough for me. And that's the wonderful fruit of Paul's labors, which would never have been gathered had he given up on Corinth too quickly. Verse number nine. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. When our determination to build a work for Christ becomes manifest to him, then the Lord takes an interest in our efforts, and he gives us aid and comfort. Verse number 11, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Beloved, a church did not spring up automatically. It took much concentrated effort by Paul and the men who worked with him to achieve the goal of getting that church on its feet. When he moved on to his next objective, he left behind the great church of Corinth with an able man named Apollos as its pastor. And I, I wonder about that name, Apollos. It sounded like he was, he was raised a very dedicated Greek pagan named after the god Apollo. And here he is now, a Baptist preacher. I love it. And that sort of thing happens. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Well, in verse number one, where did Paul go next? He went to Ephesus. And he again talked about the Holy Ghost. And they'd never heard of the Holy Ghost. And uh, they'd, they'd been baptized under John's baptism. Up, oh, time out, er, bring it to a halt, parenthesis. So what was John's baptism? John the Baptist was baptizing people to get them ready to receive the Messiah in Israel. And a whole lot of people got baptized to indicate their willingness. It was, a, it was a public symbol of their willingness to prepare their hearts to receive the Messiah in their midst. And that was the, the preparation for the coming of Christ. And so uh, apparently some of these people that got baptized in Israel spread out through the Roman Empire. And here they encounter some people who were baptized according to John's baptism. It's like, man, we're waiting and waiting and waiting for the, for the Messiah. Guess what? He came! He lived among us. He died for our sake. He rose again from the dead. He's returned to God the Father. He's coming back. And now in the interim, you can get saved. You can have your sins forgiven and a home in heaven when you die. You can have eternal life through his name. And so he explains that, and uh, that it has to do with, in verse 4, Christ Jesus. And in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Pardon for a moment. They, they, uh, he laid, Paul laid hands on them. They received the Holy Ghost. They spake with tongues and prophesied. And there were 12 men involved in this group. Now, oh, 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 now we got to talk about tongues real quick. Just in the first century, God had a way of taking a man who spoke a certain language and moving upon him so he could preach the gospel in languages he'd never learned before. That was the gift of, of tongues. And it was something to help get the gospel spreading rapidly in the first century, but it too disappeared when we had an even stronger witness, namely the Bible completed. Verse number eight. Well, he, he Paul, went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, uh, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Now this is interesting. Paul didn't let himself get discouraged because his brethren, his Jewish brethren, refused the gospel. He, he didn't let that shut him down. He just changed his tactics. He said, you know, there's some Gentile young men over here and their professors that, uh, that are open to new ideas. And so he planted himself in the middle of them and began to take them on intellectually, religiously, spiritually, and began to win his point as some of these guys began to get saved. And people would flock in to hear these debates and discussions at these schools. And no doubt, because he's named here in the scripture, the school of Tyrannus must have been well known. And so they all, all those people come in, they hear Paul, some of them are getting saved, they're taking that, that doctrine back to their towns and villages, it's spreading through the area, and, and all because a man was willing to do it a different way than would normally be done. And his, his beliefs began to spread all through the region. Verse number 10, and this continued by the space of two years. You know, I, I can see doing that for a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, a couple months is a stretch. 
But two years, day by day, Paul went and battled his way with these, these brainiacs at this school, but he was, he was winning, winning people to Christ. And what he believed, what he was being spread about Jesus all over the place, and it says in verse 10, so that all they which dwelt in Asia, now by the way, it's not Asia all the way from Russia all the way to Japan, that's a province in what's now Turkey. It's a, it's a Roman province called Asia. And that's where, that's where Ephesus was located. So that all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Paul invested himself in this city and its environs, ultimately, ultimately leaving behind the great church in Corinth. So what do we see here? We see Antioch, Corinth, Ephesus. These great churches that are familiar to us because they were so significant that the Holy Spirit had Paul write them epistles or letters that became parts of our Bible. So we're, we're somewhat familiar with, with these people. And, and, and Antioch and its effect upon us as well. Corinth got an epistle, Ephesians, Ephesus got an epistle, Antioch we know from church history. These great churches were the fruit of men's labors that were long and hard. Paul, who was a veteran church planning missionary, summarize the foremost quality needed by those who would see their church become great or perhaps your ministry within this church become great and their lives counted as significant he wrote and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we what are the last two words faint not you just can't quit you know i, was, I just I, I i going up to for baptism getting changed for baptism. I peeked in on Ramon and Sharina and Beginner Church, and uh, they've had times, and as with Nympha as well, with the Beginner Sons of Class, there were times it dwindled down to one child. I, I remember one time, the Basangs, when they, when they had Beginner Ministry, they said, Pastor, we have one child, what are we to do? I said, well, pour yourself in that one child and let's see what happens. Let's pray. Let's work. And God built it up. And of course, that's a very transient age. You know, they're there for a while. They're on, off. You know, just kind of grab them, teach them, throw them to the next class. You know, throw them up to, to uh, uh, Holly and, uh, and, and the next, next st stage in their development. But it was so neat because, again, same with the Cabreras. Dwindled down to one, two, you know, and, 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 and Nympha. And today, they had four little, little ones up there with another one who should have been there but was absent today. And it's just so neat to see that sort of thing happen. Just don't give up. And there's still coming a day when someone's going to come up to Miss Nympha and say, I love you and I thank you that you helped me. You're the one who first helped me really understand God. And the same with the Cabreras and the same with those of you that, that work with our, our, our kids at all stages of their development. It, you will reap if you faint not. Brethren, let's keep sowing the word of God into our community at large and into the hearts of individuals. Don't, let's not forget the individual. It, you know, mass evangelism is all well and good, but you know where most of our visitors come from? They come from your friends and your relatives and your neighbors and your coworkers. And, and work, work not just mass perspective, but the individual too expecting that we will reap souls saved in a great church perpetuated to the next generation if we just won't quit. Now, take that same principle of perseverance and apply it to raising your family. Just don't quit. Getting your education, see it through. Building your business, I know it's tough, it's a hard economy, but, but you, you just can't Throw in the towel. Advancing your, in your career, ditto. Advancing or expanding your walk with God. Beloved, it's discipline. It's some days you read your Bible and it's just so much black ink on white paper you don't feel like you're getting a thing out of it. And then one day it just comes alive. Your prayer life is that way. Every, everything in the Christian life. You know what? Even, if, you, if, I can, if you'll allow me to use a worldly analogy, even drugs are that way. You know, the first time that somebody uses this stuff, they'll get some kind of a, you know, a, a, a high and, and, a, and you know, weird things and, and all this stuff you know, they're seeing and experiencing. And, 
And, it, and, and by the way, I think it's, it's something that those of us who have refrained from going that direction in our lives, I think God's got a lot more than that waiting for us in heaven. <laughs> but nonetheless, I just, just, but you know what? Over time, its effect diminishes. The people are involved in, a list, in, in immorality. The, the first few times, and it's just so thrilling, but it loses something over time. Person after person, experience after experience, versus when it's kept the way God ex- wanted it within a marriage. And yeah, there's, there's peaks and valleys and there's highs and lows in that experience in marriage too, but, but overall, it's just so, it, there's such a sweetness and it's such, such a beauty about it that you wouldn't have if you're just jumping from man to man, woman to woman, bed to bed, you know, looking for the next thrill. What I'm saying is the world promises so much and delivers over time, it delivers so little. And the Lord doesn't make grandiose promises. He doesn't, you know, that's why we avoid the charismatic promises of, you know, you do this and some thrilling thing will happen to you. No, we just say, just stay, stay at it. Just keep doing your duty. Just keep doing right. Just keep serving the Lord. And every once in a while, you'll just realize this is the best thing ever. This is my joy. This is my fulfillment. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I love these kids. I love this that God's given me to do. I love this place where I serve. And developing your ministry likewise. Just let's not quit. Everything worthwhile in your life requires determination, steadfastness, and longevity. There's no way to get around it. Just simply staying put and staying at it. Let's bow our heads, please, and close our eyes. Lord Jesus, I pray that I'm setting a good example for our, our church family. And I, I know that some are aware there have been some severe challenges along the way. But I think I can also say in their presence and before you, Lord, that I did not seriously entertain running away from the problems, but have found ways, Lord, as some things were bitterly disappointing, find ways in focusing on those things that were delightful and encouraging, and just kept taking another step forward, one foot in front of the other, day after day. And I pray, God, that though I I may have some things in my life that are not enviable or I would not even want people to copy me, but I pray that in that area at least they've seen a good testimony. And Lord, I pray that all of us as a church family will be marked, will be known by the people just refuse to quit. But even as I say that, I realize that that may then be a challenge thrown before the devils of this world. And perhaps, Lord, we have some rough seas ahead of us to prove ourselves. And God, I, I pray that we'll be as good as our, as our word is tonight. Lord, under this very lovely and calm setting, it's easy to make grand pronouncements and it's easy to talk about, you know, how we want to do this and want to do that. But when it comes right down to the nitty gritty of life, when things get really, really hard, I do pray, God, that you will draw from deep within us that determination to not give up on you, <clears throat> not give up on our church, not to give up on our responsibilities, but to continue on. God, help some people here tonight determine to stay steadfast in marriage, to stay committed, Lord, to, raise, to, to pouring themselves into their kids, even if they're not seeing a great return at this moment. To continue, Lord, to give their best to their employer or in their business. To continue, Lord, e- even in a very hostile educational environment, to try to be a good student, accepting that which is true and quietly rejecting that which they know to be false. And God, in our ministries, may we, may we be determined to leave an imprint, Lord. And if we can do it with large numbers, we're thrilled. But even if it's just by one child after one child, one person after one person, but making a difference in someone's life and continuing on. I thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. Beloved, as we stand together, please. The altar is open for some, some moments.
Praise the Lord. It seems fitting that our song tonight of invitation is when the storm, till, till the storm passes over. I, I know you may be going through a storm right now, but stick it out. Stick it out. If you're here tonight and you need salvation, if you're here tonight and need baptism, we're available to serve you. Please let that be known. If you just want to come and to the altar, you're welcome to do so. Till the storm passes over, number 481. Storm passes by. 